It gets together of all the state think tanks that are around the country. And he was here one by one talking to folks about this idea he had about how, in fact, how awful the public lands issue is on the western side of the United States, but yet when you look on the eastern United States, it's the exact opposite. And that he thought there has to be a solution to this. There has to be a way to free the western states from the burden of federal land ownership. So it caught my attention because, as you all know, I am passionate about federal land policy. I've been involved, whether it was through Cattlemen's or through living here in Oregon in federal land, or a forest land policy. So I, it caught my attention. And as I sat down, I was like, wow, this guy has really, really thought through this process. And I'm excited because not only had he thought through and I thought he was just a think tanker, one of, one of those like me that thinks about solutions but really has no political clout to ever get it done. He was a representative from the, from the great state of Utah. So he, not only did he have this great intellectual capital but now he has some political capital behind it. And so I am thrilled to say that from August of last year, in fact, he has convinced the great state of Utah to pass this legislation that he believes will change this country, in fact. Not only has he taken this on at his state, he's gone state to state in all of the Western United States compassionately asking folks to adopt the same type of legislation. And we know for a fact that Arizona, New Mexico, Montana, I believe Wyoming is considering it. We've just had legislators here this morning trying to convince legislators here in Oregon to at least introduce this legislation because we believe it will take all of us working together to begin to figure out how we untie this debacle of which we call federal lands. He's also a great constitutional lawyer, and he has spent a lot of time talking and figuring out the true why it is so important and why our founding fathers believed it was so greatly important to this government that we had a balance between state powers and national powers, and what that balance looked like and how it was our responsibility at the state level to protect that. So with that, he is, he's written a wonderful book called Where's the Line? Um, you should read it. It's a really short, short read, but it's fabulous and chock full of stats and really quotes from our founding fathers of why they believed in this type of government would truly be the most powerful for the citizens that it governed. So it joined me in welcoming Ken Ivory, Representative Ken Ivory from the state of Utah. Wow, that's a lot for a guy who just got in this because I'm a dad. <laughs> True statement. When I, when I ran two years ago, I ran and said I'm a candidate in the dad party. But I have four kids. And um, if you're not really concerned right now, you should have your blood pressure checked. Um, I'm not quite sure the journey we're going to go on today. I know where we're going to end up. We could go all kinds of places. Those of you that we spent a little bit of time this morning, I, uh, I've been accused of being something like a cross-eyed discus thrower. I'm not going to set any records, but you ought to better stay awake while, I get, while I'm up there. So uh, <laughs> this is big. This is big. I'm grateful that you're here. And uh, like you, this crowd is very similar in makeup to crowds that I've spoken to across the United States. Look at the average age of the young folks to your left and your right. That's right. If, uh, if we who were privileged to be born in the United States of America and understand what that means, and understand the blessings that we received. And we who still have something of resource in time and asset and relationship and intellectual capacity and energy, if we don't act now, who will be better equipped to do that than us? 
Will the rising generation who have not been taught about our system be better equipped constitutionally, intellectually? Will the rising generation with mounting debts and deficits and unfunded obligations and devaluation of our currency be better equipped financially to deal with the challenges that we face? Now, I'm going to start and end in the same place because I don't want you to be too depressed as we start out. You've got to stay with me here, okay? This is a wonderful time to be alive, Ronald Reagan said. At the height of the Cold War, with the nuclear proliferation and the red phone, and we didn't know when things were going to fly, he said, this is a wonderful time to be alive. We're lucky not to live in pale and timid times. We've been blessed with the opportunity to stand for something. And so it is. So let's see what kind of a journey we go on. I'm not quite sure where we go. We'll see how it works out. But I was speaking in, uh, in South Dakota. Next. What am I missing here? Do I have to slide it? Oh, there we go. Oh, look at that. Okay. It's wonderful when you know how technology works. I was speaking in South Dakota recently, and I'd never been to Mount Rushmore. I thought, I'm so excited to go to Mount Rushmore, and I had this burning question. Washington, I get it. Jefferson, I get it. Lincoln, I get it. I didn't get it. <laughs> and so I went and asked them, and she was very patient with me and kind and explained why he's there. And as I pressed her and pressed her and pressed her, it turns out that the sculptor was the, uh, one of the main campaign managers for Roosevelt in his bull moose party run for president. And so a few years after he passed away, he shows up on this incredible monument. But that's not really the point. The point is I was looking at that, and you walk through there, and you see this monument to independence. By their own statement, they said Jefferson and Washington and Lincoln and all that they did to build the independence in our nation and this monument to ingenuity and grit and industry of our nation. I thought, how incredible. And then I thought, well, wow. What if we tried to do something like that today? Think about it, right? You've got to go in, you've got to cut down a whole bunch of trees. You gotta take a bunch of machines up in the forest and you might scare some animals. And you're gonna take dynamite and you're gonna blast off the face of the mountain. And you're gonna do it in an area that a group of people may claim is sacred or somehow special to them. I mean, we, you, you laugh. Think of what that says. You can't even think the thought. It's, 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 it's ridiculous, it's laughable in our age today to even think the thought of building a monument to independence. And so we have a monument to dependence. And we're seeing this all throughout the Western United States. This is our monument to dependence. Rather than the healthy, productive forest, We've become dependent. I was hearing from some of your good county commissioners and school board members that these thriving communities with abundant, we've been blessed with abundant renewable resource are now entirely dependent, impoverished communities with an abundant resource burning to the ground as a monument to dependence. And so this is the great revolution that we have today. In fact, it is a revolution of the Declaration of Independence on the one hand versus the Declaration of Dependence. Think of our ideology, right? Our unprecedented ideology. Protect life. Secure liberty. Establish the right and control of property. And with those blessings, we stand accountable to a supreme creator for how we bless other people's lives with those unalienable rights. That's our unprecedented ideology. What we've seen is an assault on that ideology on so many fronts to erode the very foundation of that unprecedented ideology and return it back to the ideology that has dominated through most of recorded history centralized command and control of property and resource. 
and you have the liberty to do what I tell you you can do. I don't care if you call it communism, fascism, socialism, totalitarianism. It's all the same. The ideology is I'll control the land and all the means of production, and you have the liberty to do what I tell you you can do. Where are we today? In fact, there's a slide in here somewhere. I don't think I have it in this order, but there's a slide in here somewhere. Maybe we'll get to it. John Kenneth Galbraith in the early 80s, world-renowned economist, said, uh, where socialized ownership of land is concerned, only the USSR and China can claim company with the United States of America. And since the 1980s, when he made that statement, China has been liberalizing the private control of property. The former Soviet Union has been liberalizing the private control of property. And in the land of the free and the home of the brave, as we just heard from the prior speaker, centralizing the right and control of property even more. So here's uh, another monument. 1880, tombstone, middle of the desert in Arizona. Tombstone, with the grit and the industry and ingenuity of Americans, ran water lines in 1880 across the deserts 30 miles to the Huachuca Mountains and tapped into 25 mountain springs and brought life to a desert town. What a monument to independence. They used that water for 130 years. They used the road for 130 years on the land that they own for 130 years. 1984, they make a wilderness area. They say, don't worry, you're grandfathered in. If you need to get to your water, just let us know that you're going up there. Eight or nine years ago, the Forest Service came to Tombstone and said, hey, can we tap into your water to fight fires if need be? They said, well, sure, of course. You can tap into our water to fight fires. Last year, they had the Monument Fire. Half a million acres, you're familiar with that story. You're living it here. Half a million acres burns. Incidentally, according to Government Accountability Office own documents, the so-called preservationist policies are doubling the acreage of fires, doubling the intensity of fires, doubling the cost of the fires. And on the heels of the fire, they have monsoon rains and do a thousand years of erosion damage in a month. Boulders the size of Volkswagens wash out all 25 of the springs. Town of Tombstone is left without water. And they contact the Forest Service and say, oh, by the way, we're going to go up as we talked about before, remember, the grandfather thing. We're going to go up and on our road to our land and restore our water. And the Forest Service says, um, you don't own that water. And they spent weeks documenting their chain of title sufficiently. And the Forest Service comes back and says, well, you don't need all that water. They put that one to bed, and then they say, well, you need a permit. You need a permit to go up and repair your springs. And so they go through the process, weeks go by, and they get a permit, and they go to the first spring with mechanized equipment to repair the first spring, and they go to move to the second spring. And they say, oh, no, 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 no. That permit's only good for one spring. You have to get a permit for each of your 25 springs, and oh, by the way, we have a new rule that you can't take any mechanized equipment up into the forest. Horses and hand tools. Two hour walk up a mountain. I've done it several times. Two hour walk up the mountain. In fact, one day they went to, uh, they thought, well, we'll at least take a wheelbarrow, make our job a little bit easier, moving those boulder sized rocks and we'll have a wheelbarrow. They were again, again met by armed forest service agents. Think, no, did you not understand that you can't take mechanized equipment into the forest? We have a policy. So here's the town of Tombstone that is a national historic site under federal law to be preserved as a national historic site that has 30 minutes of water from going up entirely in smoke. They have a well that is 80% of the arsenic limit, and so you have a Forest Service supervisor, unelected, making a policy that said, it's our policy that you can't access this land, never mind that you have 30 minutes from your town going up in smoke, never mind that your children are drinking water that is 80% 80, 80 of the arsenic limit. Declaration of Independence, Declaration of Dependence. You know about this. 
family farms, you can't drive a tractor or spray pesticide or your children can't help out on the farms. And, and if they can't get the regulation in one place, they'll put it in somewhere else, but shutting down your right to use your land, even if you do own it. You've probably seen this, a quick story in Utah. We built an airport in Southern Utah and they went to build the connecting road out to the highway and the Army Corps of Engineers came and said, stop everything. This is navigable waters, of course. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, I'm telling you. Navigable waters. Months, millions of dollars. Businesses that had ramped up inventory to supply the project go out of business, fire all their employees. Because this is navigable waters. You know about this. Hundreds of millions of dollars to build the facility and they come in and say, well, you can't employ people there. Because you have a building in another state that employs people in a certain way, so you can't actually employ people a different way in this state. Stop everything. Because they have a policy against people on the ground exercising their jurisdiction over the health, safety, and welfare to protect the lives, the safety of their people. You know about this. I mean, we could go on all day. I mean, you guys, I would actually look forward. Please email me your stories. They go on and on and on. But you know this, right? The little fish. We don't need food. I mean, come on. One of the most productive farming areas in our country. We can't have that going on. We can't have that monument to independence and industry and grit and ingenuity of Americans. We need you to be dependent. You know about this. You just had your Wallawa, what's it called? Wallawa Whitman and some of your good uh, fellow Oregonians said, we don't think so. And stood up and said, no, we, we do. that policy where you just shut everything down, that's happening all over the West. It's happening all over, the, in fact, in Elko, Nevada. Elko, Nevada. They came in our travel management plan. We want to shut down all the roads in Elko, Nevada. And the county of Elko documented 104 different contacts in trying to coordinate, cooperate with the Forest Service. And ultimately, they came in and they said, here's our plan, but we did make some concessions based on the things that you, you asked us about. You all said that you are a big place for hunting, and, and hunting is important, and you have deer all over your country, and you have deer hunters coming in, and it's important for you to go off the road to be able to recover a deer if someone shoots a deer that comes into your county because you have lots of deer. We're going to allow you to go off the road a half a mile to recover an elk between 9 in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. That was their one concession. $168 million adverse economic impact just to the county of Alco, Nevada. Independence, dependence. In fact, uh, this is the uh, fire director from the Santa Fe National Forest. Healthy forest, nine, or healthy forest, about 40 trees per acre. Right now they're running about 900 trees per acre. You know all about this. You know, I've learned so much from, from your people this morning. But that, that healthy forest, properly managed, retains the water and s creates that sponge and, and that renewable resource. And, and by properly harvesting that renewable resource, it even grows better. But no, instead, we turn the sponge into saran wrap and we wash everything down. What we're seeing all throughout the West, the fire goes through. Then you have devastating floods that just wipe off all the, all the topsoil, decimates the watershed for decades. And in the process, billions of pounds of pollution, more carbon than all the coal-fired power plants combined, killing tens of millions of animals. This is Utah, but every, every state is about in the same boat. This is what actually got me into this. I was an economics geek. I used to work for the mayor of the city of Osaka, and when I got there the first week on the job, they said, we're glad to have you here. Most important bilateral relationship in the world. But just, this is in the mid-80s, guys. But just so you know, we're looking to China because you've broken the basic law of economics in the United States. You have to produce more than you consume and you invest the difference in additional production capacity. You've already broken that rule, so we're looking to China. History tells us what happens to nations that go the way you're going. This is in the mid-80s. Really ticked me off. Just ticked me off. And so I became a, a junior international political economist for the last 30 years to study 
what they were telling me. Now, never mind that they didn't take their own advice. I mean, they're in a tremendous situation, but they were right. But so where we are in this, this is what got me involved and interested that, that, that we're so dependent on a fiscally suicidal federal government. So Utah is 5.2 billion out of 13. Every state is somewhere between 30 to 50% of your budget comes from a federal government that is completely broke. This was uh, about 18 months ago now. After the 2008 meltdown, President Obama appointed Erskine Bowles, who was the Clinton White House Chief of Staff, Alan Simpson, former Republican Senator from Wyoming, to be the co-chairs of the National Fiscal Responsibility Commission to study what happened in 2008 and, and what the implications are going forward. 18 months ago, now hopefully is the audio gonna work on this? In theory, well, let's see, let's see how, let's see, let's see how effective your prayers were this morning, okay? We'll see how this works out. Um, so 18 months ago, this was his testimony to the Senate Budget Committee. A lot of us sitting in this room didn't see this last crisis as it came upon us. But this one is really easy to see. The fiscal crisis is the biggest one we are are incurring on an annual basis are like a cancer and they are truly going to destroy this country from within unless we have the common sense to do something about it. This is a problem we're going to have to face up to in maybe two years, you know, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. But if uh, our bankers over there in Asia begin to believe that we're not going to be solid on our debt, that we're not going to be able to meet our obligations. Just stop and think for a minute what happens if they just stop buying our debt. What happens to interest rates? And what happens to the U.S. economy? The markets will absolutely devastate us if we don't step up to this problem. The problem is real. The solutions are painful, and we have to act. What I tell people is very simple. And people in America are way ahead of all of you. They know what's going on, because when you say, why don't you go back and think of what people are doing at their kitchen table? I'll tell you what they're doing at their kitchen table. They know that if you spend more than you earn, you lose your flat. And they know that if you spend a buck and borrow 40 cents, so that you must be stupid. And they've got to figure it out that this, this government is stupid. To borrow 40 cents for every buck you spend, forget the charts, forget the GDP, all of that stuff. That's where we are. I think we face the most predictable economic crisis in history. A lot of us sitting in this room didn't see this last. Don't know why that looped through, but he goes on to say, he says, let me tell you how crazy it is. So we have this treaty that if China were to attack Taiwan, we're supposed to defend Taiwan. The only problem is you have to borrow the money from China. Uh, this is tremendous. And so after this stark warning, we have two years, maybe a little less, maybe a little more until the most predictable economic crisis in history. That was 18 months ago. So, of course, Congress got busy, heeded the warning, and solved the problem, right? Yay, we're, we're done here. My work is done here, right? No, in August, right? In August, they had the, uh, the debt ceiling fiasco and, 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 and bipartisan. You're ugly, and you're ugly, and you smell funny, and we can't solve this problem. We're going to push this problem, 2011 Budget Control Act, we're going to push this problem down the road to a super committee. The super committee's job, this cracks me up, you can't make this stuff up. The super committee's job, to cut $1.2 trillion over 10 years, while we're overspending a trillion and a half dollars each and every year. That was the definition of success and they couldn't do that. So what the Budget Control Act said is if the super committee fails, which we know it did, then January 1 of 2013, three months away, January 1 of 2013, 9% across the board cuts in federal discretionary spending, 10% cuts in military. Remember that 40 to 50% of our budget that comes from a fiscally suicidal federal government? We still have to educate our children 
and take care of our sick people and our poor people and public safety despite the fiscal suicide that's happening in Washington. It's a wonderful time to be alive. Did you had your Sweet 16 party a couple weeks ago, right? Can you believe that trajectory? It took 200 years to accumulate the first trillion dollars in debt. It took 286 days to accumulate the last trillion. In fact, the trillion and a half that we're overspending is just the official overspend. If we're accounting on the same way that all of our businesses, states, counties do, $5 trillion overspend. $5 trillion a year. $3.8 trillion in expense, $2.3 trillion in revenue. The overspend is $5 trillion a year. Now raise your hand when you're, when you're done with the idea that you understand and feel down to your gut the immediacy and severity of the problem, and then we can move on to the solutions. Are you, are you, are you ready now? Okay, we're, we're good. All right. Well, here's, uh, this came out of the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Federal regulation as of 2008, the cost of complying with federal regulation, they estimate, is $2 trillion a year. That's roughly the size of the German economy. Fifth largest economy in the world is the, is the backpack full of rocks that we get up every morning and put on before we go out to try to be productive in the world. $2 trillion. Constitution had three federal felonies in the Constitution. I promise the good stuff's coming. Three federal felonies in the Constitution, right? Treason, piracy, counterfeiting. Any idea how many federal felonies there are today? Nobody else knows either. They quit counting at 5,000. That doesn't count all the criminalization under the regulations. Where's the line on this? Where's the line? Now, in addition to this, then we've got this lovely situation. What's really fun, and, and I kind of struggled with where to go on this. I mean, we, I could talk about this all day long. I, your basic American rights, we wanted to kind of talk about some structural system issues to have a framework for how we deal with this. But uh, at another opportunity, perhaps we can spend a day just on this. But what's fascinating is you look at that and, and the fundamental question, why? Why the difference? And if you actually listen for answers, they're really funny. You have to be really patient. Once you understand the basics on this, you listen for the answers. We'll talk about those as we get along, but there's that slide we talked about. But look at the, look at the similarity. The uh, wildfires greater than 250 acres, States that have the hardest time funding education. <laughs> Systemically, it's kind of like this. We had an unprecedented system that was designed, it was engineered with two balanced wheels. I was, I was teaching a constitution class to fifth graders. I said, well, why do you have two wheels on a bicycle? Well, stability and direction and, and, and all the things it allows you to do. Well, what if you keep riding that bike like that? God, if you keep riding it like this, it's gonna break. You might never even be able to repair it if you, if you keep it like that. Well, what should we do? <laughs> That's easy. Let some air out of that tire, put some air in this tire, no problem. Are we smarter than a fifth grader? So this is what, when we talk about checks and balances, we've seen this, right? Executive, legislative, judicial, give me the gold star. I know, I know government. James Madison said, however, who knew a thing or two about the Constitution, that's a single republic. In the compound Republic of America, however, the power surrendered by the people is divided among two distinct governments. They control each other as a double security to the rights of the people. You ever seen a chart like that before in your fifth grade, eighth grade, twelfth grade college history classes? And in fact, that's not the rest of the story. The rest of the story is that the power delegated was few and defined. The power reserved was numerous and indefinite. That's what our government looks like, what it's supposed to look like. That's how it was engineered. That's the blueprint. That's the as-built. 
plan. And yet all we ever see, executive, legislative, judicial, that's all there is for checks and balances. Is it not interesting then when all things are drawn to Washington, as Thomas Jefferson said, when all things are drawn to Washington in small as in great things, foreign and domestic, it'll render powerless the checks of one government on another and become as venal and oppressive as the government from which we separated. Is it any surprise that out of Washington, when you have by nature the power dynamics, the competition of power, that out of Washington you hear repeatedly, hey, we're supreme. Supremacy clause, that means we get to do whatever we want. I was just in a meeting with a U.S. attorney a couple days ago. Supreme, we get to do whatever we want. Well, here's what the Supreme Court said about that. Citing Federalist 39, the local or municipal authorities form distinct and independent portions of the supremacy. No more subject within their respective spheres to the general authority then the general authority is subject to them within their own sphere. Yes, the federal government is supreme in the few and defined things delegated to it, as are the states supreme in all things reserved. Don't wait around for a Forest Service agent to tell you that. Don't wait around for a BLM agent or a U.S. attorney to tell you that. We'll get into some other things on that, but If we don't understand our system, we can expect that in the very power dynamics, it's the nature of man and government to amass unbridled power. That's the nature. Our founders knew that. That's why Madison said, if men were angels, we wouldn't need government. If angels were to govern, we wouldn't need internal and external checks. But if the external check is asleep, it's what government does. Government does what it can. We get the government we either demand or tolerate. In fact, John Dickinson put it this way. The government of each state is and is to be sovereign and supreme in all matters that relate to each state only and subordinate barely in those matters that relate to the whole. It'll be their own fault. If the several states suffer the federal sovereignty to interfere in the things of their jurisdiction. This idea of a line is not something that we just created out of thin air. James Wilson, who has the distinction of being a signer of the Declaration of Independence, one of the ratifiers of the Constitution, and an original Supreme Court justice. Probably a decent source, don't you think? He said, this Constitution deserves praise for the accuracy of the line that we drew between the powers of the states and the general government. Thomas Jefferson said, it must be the states themselves Erecting barriers at the constitutional line that cannot be surmounted either, either by themselves or by the general government. James Madison, on the floor of Congress, ratifying the Bill of Rights. State legislatures will jealously and closely watch the operations of this federal government and be able to resist with more effect every assumption of power better than any power on earth can do because they are the sure guardians of the people's liberty. The sure guardians of school districts whose towns are being decimated and impoverished with resources all over their mountain. The sure guardians of towns like Tombstone where a federal policy prevents them from their water that is life in a desert. Sure guardians of the people's liberty. Here's your quiz for today. Who said this? For 150 years, we knew exactly where that line was. Congress has been given the right to legislate on particular subjects, but this is not the case in the vast number of other vital problems of government, such as the conduct of public utilities, of banks, of insurance, of business, of agriculture, of education, of social welfare, of a dozen other important features in these, Washington must not be encouraged to interfere. Any of you sign on to that statement? Who said that? Yeah, you probably have my life. If you, if you looked at the bookmark, you, you, could, you could cheat and look ahead.
governor, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, as governor of New York, in these things Washington must not interfere. And in fact, for 150 years, federal spending as a percentage of GDP was 3%. Today it's more than 26%, plus the unfunded obligations, plus the regulatory burden, plus, plus, plus. 150 years it was in a small, confined constitutional box. And with no other substantive amendments in the Constitution since then, how did we get here? It would be our own fault if we allow the federal government to interfere in the things of our jurisdiction. Um, this says it's about out of power, this remote up here. I don't know if you have a power cord that we can plug in here. and. We have the, I, um, I have one in my bag. Yeah, it was, okay. So, so, where there's no line, there's no limit. Where there's no limit, there's no liberty. This concept of a line, and we are the guardians, and our representatives are the guardians of that line. This is our system. It takes those two functioning mechanisms. Now, what I want to get to, and I don't know how much time we have. Someone help me out here. Um, um, a lot of time. Oh, well, good. Okay, good. Well, then you're going to get the whole load. <laughs> so let's talk about solutions, okay? Hopefully you've got the vision of the immediacy and the severity of the problem. If you're not excited now, wake up. If you're not excited now, buckle your chin strap. We had, a, we had a church leader in uh, Utah who passed away a few years ago. Shortly before he passed away, he said, from here on out, it's all high adventure. <laughs> it's all high adventure. So, let's look here. 50% state controlled, less than 50% of the land is controlled by the states on the, on the west. More than 95% of the land is controlled by the states east of Colorado. Look at Hawaii, though. It's not just the western states. Hawaii controls all of its land. What's up with that? Now, here's what's fascinating about this. Did you, did, did, did you all get a little card? Did we pass the little cards around so you've got this map? Okay, so here, here we go. This is, this is your homework assignment, okay? You're going to teach this to at least two people. And I'm going to ask you to study at least two things on the website. The AmericanLandsCouncil.org website, there's a resources tab. I want you to study at least two things, one of them being the Andrew Jackson veto statement, and hopefully we'll get there. Um, but, but here's what we're going to do. When you teach this, we're going to ask four questions, four simple questions. Number one, why the difference? The promises are the same. The promises in our enabling acts in most cases are word for word the same with respect to disposal of the public lands. Why the difference? Now what you'll hear when you ask that question, they'll say, well, you gave up your land. You didn't want it at statehood. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? No? <laughs> We've got one who's gonna stand up, right? <laughs> of course not! Makes no sense at all. Promises are the same. But what they'll say is, in your Enabling Act, it says the people of the state forever disclaim all right and title to the unappropriated public lands, and they act as if there's a period right there. It's only half the sentence, but they act as if there's a period. See? You gave it up. The rest of the sentence, if you bother to read it, says, until title thereto shall have been extinguished. It's subject to disposition meaning to dispose of. Going back to 1780, when they made this incredible trust agreement among the states for the federal government to only hold the land as a trustee to create new distinct Republican states with the same rights of sovereignty, freedom, and independence as all the other states and use the proceeds to pay the public debt. And to enact regulations only for the purpose of disposing of the land. And in 1784, after they won the war, Thomas Jefferson drafted the land ordinance and said the same thing. And he said that the states will not interfere with that trust compact that they made in 1780, and they will not interfere with the primary disposal of the soil by the federal government to create new states, use the proceeds to pay the public debt, or with any of the re regulations for securing title in the soil to the bona fide purchasers. And the states will be on an equal footing, the first time that term comes up that I found. 1787, they get around to start making new states, 
and they craft the Northwest Ordinance and they say the same thing. The states will not interfere with the primary disposal duty of the federal government that's holding just mere title as a trustee to create new states, use the proceeds to pay the public debt, nor will they interfere with any regulations for securing title in the soil to the bona fide purchasers, and the states will be on an equal footing in all respects whatsoever. So then we come to Article 4, Section 3 of the Constitution, which my good friend, a U.S. attorney a few days ago, told me means we can do whatever we want. Because in Article 4, Section 3 of the Constitution, it says, Congress shall have the power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations regarding the territory. So obviously that means we can do whatever we want, including not dispose when the power is to dispose, right? And then they cite the supremacy clause that says we win, you lose, which is like playing shoots and ladders with my daughter when she was a young, young girl. Every day we'd play and she'd say, I, Dad, Dad, you can't do that. I'm like, well, that's what the rule was yesterday. Yeah, but that's not the rule today. <laughs> it's kind of like that, right? We win, you lose no matter what. But so that's where they go. But when you think about Article 4, Section 3, and I wish, uh, I don't know if I have this, it's a different slide makeup here, but uh, do I have those? No, I don't have those yet, but I, I wanna kinda go there while we're here. So Article 4, Section 3, in the constitutional debate, there's one page of debate on Article 4, Section 3, and the one page of debate, they say, this is just to preserve the status quo. Well, what's the status quo? in September of 1787. The status quo is the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 that says, we're not going to interfere with your primary duty to dispose of the land, to create new states and use the proceeds to pay the debt. And it's 1784, the land ordinance drafted by Thomas Jefferson that says, we're not going to interfere with your primary duty to dispose of the land. And it's the Ordinance of 1780 that created this trust to resolve the great embarrassment that they had. They were almost at a civil war in the midst of the revolution where they had, they had Robert Morris, who pledged his life, fortune, sacred honor, right? He funded the first three years of the revolution himself, $2 million, back when $2 million was $2 million. And he was tapped out and they said, what do we do now? And so in 1763, when the king granted the colonial charters to the colonies, they said, here's your boundaries, and seven of you, he said, you can claim the western wastelands. And even among the seven of them, they had competing overlapping claims. So by 1780, when they're trying to figure out how to pay for the revolution, the six states said, we've got to do revenue enhancements. And the seven said, no sweat, we'll just sell some of these western lands. And the six said, hey, wait a minute. You're going to sell lands. We've got to tax our people. They're going to flee our state and go to you. And oh, by the way, in case you hadn't noticed, we're all contributing our blood and treasure to this great cause. And for you to just sell these lands and end up as these big states and we lose all of our people, we're not going there. It was so intense, they called it the great embarrassment. It was about to melt everything down in how they funded and moved forward in the revolution. And that's when this great compromise, this solemn compact, Andrew Jackson called it, which is one of your homework assignments that you're going to read on the resources tab in the website. The Andrew Jackson statement about how that came about, that solemn compact that he said formed the very basis upon which our nation was made. It would not have happened. We would not have gotten to a constitution but for that first great compromise. And so when they got to 1787 and they're drafting Article 4 and they said, this is just to preserve the status quo. the great trust, to hold the land only to dispose, to create distinct Republican states, to use the proceeds to pay the debt. The other part of Article 4 says, nothing in this Constitution shall prejudice any claims that the United, of the United States or of the several states. Think about that for a second. From 1763, the states had claims on the Western lands in their colonial charters. In 1780, they collectivized their claims and said, okay, United States, you have a claim on these lands to pay the debt. The rest of the states have a claim on those lands for you to only create distinct Republican states, not to create some other new form of government where you have territories and colonies and whatnot throughout. You now know more about Article 4, Section 3 than most any lawyer you'll run into. Because what the U.S. Attorney just told me a couple of days ago was, oh, that means we can do whatever we want. Well, that makes perfect constitutional sense given our history, doesn't it? We were fighting a war against a land baron and they would do anything to open the door, even a crack, to create a centralized land baron? 
Aren't we smarter than a fifth grader? <laughs> That's Article 4, Section 3. And so in 1830, by 1830, the United States had paid off the debt of the war. How would that be? And so Congress, looking at that, Henry Clay, senator from Kentucky, Henry Clay proposed a land bill. And in the land bill, he said, here's what we're going to do. We have to dispose of the land. That's indisputable. That's the great national public trust, he called it. We have to dispose of the land. In fact, it's done as a trust because that's the highest duty known to law, the utmost good faith and loyalty. And if there were a breach of the trust, there's no other remedy but a breach of the peace to solve it. This is the highest duty we can create in this great national public trust to dispose of the land. That was the debate on the Senate floor. But because they paid off the debt, Congress said, well, here's what we'll do. We'll dispose of the land, but we'll keep the money in this big chest in Congress. And when the states and the counties do what we want, we'll give them some money. Does that sound familiar? And so the House and Senate pass that bill and it goes to President Andrew Jackson and he vetoes it on that basis. Again, you don't understand this solemn compact, this sacred trust on why we even got to a constitution in resolving those claims of those Western lands and being able to move forward and prosecute the revolution. You don't understand, you've lost sight of that. Now, Andrew Jackson, it perplexed me for a while. Where did he get his information? He wrote this great history. It's the most comprehensive, contemporaneous history on this public land debate that you'll find anywhere. Where did he get his information? What was he studying? What was he reading? And then I studied a little bit about Andrew Jackson. He was born in 1767. So by 1787, he's not some 20 year old sitting in his basement playing video games. <laughs> he's a 20 year old attorney in Tennessee, which is one of those areas that's yet to be a state. And he, he spent his military career in Orleans and in all this Western territory yet to be a state. His whole life was intensely interested in this history. And so by 1833, when he drafted his veto statement, history, he had lived it. Now he documents it very meticulously, but he lived the history. And so in that history, and I wish my slides were in order, I just, like I said, I never know where I'm gonna go and my slides certainly don't know where I'm going. <laughs> but in his history, he says, the price of these lands shall be reduced and graduate. Oh, you know what? Let me stop. Kind of, you're gonna have to edit that video, okay? We're gonna have to cut back, but so this is really good. So here's what happens. So the Western states at some point with that whole map of all the red, they get, they get fed up with all this stuff. Oh, I'm just giving away the punchline here. They get fed up and they say, look, you're not disposing of the land like you promised. We can't tax the land to educate our kids. We can't grow our economies and provide good paying jobs. Sound familiar, Rob? And you're hoarding all of our abundant minerals and natural resources that we've been blessed with. That was in 1828. In 1828, the Western states by their own description, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, that great Western state of Florida. Florida said, we're worse off than all the Western states in how much the federal government is controlling us. Missouri, they had controlled 90% of the land for decades. Illinois, the federal government had controlled 90% of the land for decades. And uh, back when men were men and states were states, they said, uh, you have to keep your promise. You will keep your promise and all that that implies. And they got together and they sent resolution after resolution, delegation after delegation, petition after petition, every substantial contact they had with the federal government, when are you gonna keep your promise? Our children are suffering. When are you gonna keep your promise? Our, ch our people are fleeing the state. When are you gonna keep your promise so that we can access our minerals and not only grow our economy for us, but for the nation? It's fabulous, the things, if you read what they said, it's all on the website. You can read their original resolutions and things. They're all on the website, it's phenomenal. But this is, this is the Public Lands Committee of Congress, the report of the Public Lands Committee in Congress in 1828. If these lands are withheld from sale, which is the effect of the present system, in vain may the people of those states expect the benefits of well-settled neighborhoods so essential to the education of their youth. When these states, uh, these states will for many generations without some change be retarded in their endeavors to increase their wealth and comfort because they have not the power incident to all sovereign states 
of taxing the soil to pay for the benefits conferred upon the owners. When these states stipulated not to tax the lands, they rested upon the implied engagement. Go look at Article 6, Clause 1 about engagements entered into before the Constitution being valid and binding after the Constitution, like the 1780 Resolution, like the, North, the Land Ordinance of 1784, like the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. They rested upon the implied engagement of Congress to cause them to be sold within a reasonable time. No just equivalent's been given those states for a surrender of an attribute of sovereignty so essential to their welfare and an equal standing with the other states. I love that sentence at the bottom. It says, a, great, a remedy for such great evils for once, I completely agree with Congress. A remedy for such great evils may be found in simply carrying into effect the federal constitution, which knows of no inequality in the powers and rights of the several states. This is an example of one of the petitions, Missouri, you'll see, the present condition of the Western states. Missouri never would have uh, been brought to consent not to tax the lands if we knew you were never gonna dispose of them. We agreed that we wouldn't tax them for five years while you were selling them. We never would have agreed that you were gonna hold nine tenths of those lands from ever becoming property in the hands of, of persons who they might be taxed. And then here's the Andrew Jackson statement, right? The reason they succeeded in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s was because they knew their history. They knew their rights. They banded together and they simply refused to take no for an answer. Andrew Jackson, and you gotta read the whole thing. I think I've highlighted almost everything but about two paragraphs in there already for you, it's phenomenal. Price of these lands shall be reduced and graduated, and after they've been offered for a certain number of years, the refuse remaining unsold shall be abandoned to the states and the machinery of our land system entirely withdrawn. How would that look? That was the history, that was the promise, that was the solemn compact, that was the sacred trust. Because they knew their history and they knew their rights and they banded together, they succeeded. And if you look on your little map today, they have three to four percent federally controlled land. This is our one and only Supreme Court Justice from Utah, U.S. Supreme Court Justice. Man has three great rights equally sacred from arbitrary interference on all fronts. To give a man his life but deny him his liberty is to take from him all that makes his life worth living. To give him his liberty but take from him the property which is the fruit and badge of his liberty is to still leave him a slave. Whether you take it by refusing to dispose of it as is your duty, whether you take it by regulation, whether you take it by policy, you leave him a slave. You leave his children impoverished. You leave them poor. You leave them dependent instead of independent. Now I wanna take you, there's so much more we can talk about on the lands situation and at another time perhaps, or we, we can break off somewhere, but um, two months ago, I was in Washington when the uh, Affordable Care Act decision was announced. In law school, I had a good law professor, my probably only conservative law professor, tax professor, he said, uh, whenever they name a federal bill, just put the word not in front of it. <laughs> and you're gonna be more accurate 90% of the time. So when the not Affordable Care Act decision was announced, I stayed awake all night long and read it. I read all 200 some odd pages all night and I woke up in the morning and my, my travel companion, when we met for breakfast, I said, Mike, Justice Roberts is an evil genius. No. Oh, hang on, wait, wait for me now. <laughs> Justice Roberts is an evil genius. And then we turned on the TV and we started hearing this. Oh, he's a turncoat. Oh, he's a fraidy cat. Oh, he's this, that, and the other. I mean, really? Come on, Dennis, you've been in here how long? I mean, do you care what the newspapers say? Because you know what it's going to be. It's, it's, it's largely not going to be, forgive our good press people here, but... Uh, but uh, not based on research. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's frequently inaccurate. It's frequently pursuing an agenda. He's the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He's gonna be afraid of a headline? I don't buy that. That is so simplistic. Look at what he says. Now, who's, do, we, do we have anybody that still has small children at home? Carla, how old are your children? Five. Five, you have just one? Oh, you can't play, you're not a real parent. <laughs> Until you have the he's looking at me and she's touching me and that going on, come on. Come on. So work with me now, all right? Work with me now. I've got some of them here that appreciate this. So you got them coming to you and they say, Mom, 
He's looking at me, she's touching me, solve my problem. Suppose you do, and they come back again. Solve my problem, and you do, 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 and years go by, and finally they're 25, and they're 30, and they come to you and they say, Mom, could I have permission to act like an adult now? Right? That's what this decision is. This decision is the grow up decision. None of us likes to hear that. No one likes to hear grow up. But work with me here. Look at what he says. Federal government's expanded dramatically over the last two centuries. Uh, duh. But it still must show that a constitutional grant of power authorizes each of its actions. The same does not apply to the states. Because the Constitution is not the source of their power. State governments do not need constitutional authorization to act. Our cases refer to this general power of governing to protect the health and the safety and the welfare of their communities. Our cases refer to this general power of governing possessed by the states but not by the federal government as the police power. The framers ensured that the powers in the ordinary course of affairs that concern the lives, the liberties, and the properties of the people, our very ideology, <coughs> were held by governments more local and more accountable than a distant federal bureaucracy. This independent power, not mother may I, <coughs> not pretty please, this independent power serves as a check on the federal government. Remember the bicycle? Remember the balance? They still believe that stuff, do we? Do we? Yeah. This independent power of the states also serves as a check on the power of the federal government. By denying anyone, by denying any one government complete jurisdiction over all the concerns of public life, federalism the governing partnership. That's what we call the governing partnership. Not subordinate subdivision, partners. If we act like a dependent, we'll be treated like a dependent. If we act like a partner, we can expect to be treated like a partner, but not until we act like a partner. Federalism protects the liberty of the individual, of the children, and of the environment, and of the economic self-reliance of our communities. From arbitrary, they're talking about federal power. That partnership, that system. We get so busy talking about issues. We have a system problem. We have a bicycle problem. And the longer we keep trying to ride that bicycle faster and harder, we're going to break the chains and snap the crank, and then who knows where we go. We have a system problem. And we're so busy about issues. We have to fix the system first. Here's the punchline. In the typical case, we look to the states to defend their prerogative by adopting the simple expedient, the simple expedient of not yielding to federal blandishments when they do not want to embrace the federal policies as their own. I had to look up blandishments, coaxing, coercing, cajoling, right? By adopting the simple expedient of not yielding to federal blandishments when they do not want to embrace the federal policies as their own. States are separate and independent sovereigns. Sometimes they have to act like it. <laughs> Grow up. But you've got counties, do you not? You have cities, do you not? We can throw up our hands all we want. There are also states where states do have jurisdictions. But you have jurisdiction in your counties. You have jurisdiction in your cities. And you have the ability at the local level to get on about it. Or we can cry in our beer. But at the state level, you organize 10 people to go elect a state representative. And if your state representative is already one of the good guys, and you have several of them here, then go help someone else and get 10 people on the ground because these, these representatives here will tell you 10 people make the difference. You have 10 people that will give you an hour a week and will commit to give you an hour a week to make phone calls, to pound signs, to walk neighborhoods, to, 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 to deliver things on doors. Representatives, make all the difference in the world. 10 people. 
10 people. Typical campaign, you're lucky if you get five. 10 people. Look at what's here. If you all got five, if you all got 10, the difference that you would make in teaching people that we may safely rely on the state legislatures to erect barriers against the encroachments of the national authority. Alexander Hamilton, the big government of his, of, of his big government guy of his day said. If we were to act, we've been in this mode of feed me, take care of me, make the decisions for me, pretty please and mother may I. This is as exciting as it gets, but it's all high adventure from here. Not yield to the federal blandishments is what he said, right? Well, but so that's why, yeah, you're going to be a heavier lift. But you can, you know, like, like Erskine Bowles said, you can stick your head in the sand or you can get busy. <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, if, you, if there's an attitude issue, that's not, you know, I'm not here for that. I'm here about boots on the ground. How do we get things done? But so imagine Kentucky, right? In that great national championship game, imagine that Kentucky said, guys, we're going to stay on this half of the court and we're going to play world-class defense, but we're never crossing that line. We're going to play the best defense that anybody's ever played and we'll lose ground. And that becomes the new normal. And we lose ground again and that becomes the new normal. And we lose ground again and that becomes the new normal. And then we wonder what happened to our schools and our forests and our economy and we lose ground and that becomes the new normal. Let me tell you a little story quickly. Hot Rod Hundley is the voice of the Utah Jazz. And Hot Rod Hundley graduated uh, college with Will Chamberlain, played professionally with him a little bit. And when he speaks, he'll tell the story and he says, you know, one night, Will and I, we combined for 52 points to win the game. He said, Rod, how many points did you score? He said, doesn't matter. And if you press him, you say, Rod, how many points did you score? And he said, well, uh, yeah, I scored two points. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You have jurisdictional giants amongst you. You have county commissioners. You have school board members. You have city council members. You have good representatives that with just a little bit of extra effort, you may have a jurisdictional giant in your state. In states like Utah and Idaho and Arizona and others and Oklahoma and Georgia and Texas, there are jurisdictional giants in those states that you can support very effectively even from, from Oregon. And so it's rallying around those jurisdictional giants and scoring your two points and feeding them the ball. And get out of the way. Feed them the ball. And when the other team boos and has their signs and calls them ugly names, you know how it works. You've got to cheer even louder. And you've got to wave your pom-poms even more furiously. And when your jurisdictional giants take hard actions and take the elbows and take the shots, you've got to be there to encourage and support them. It makes a difference. I can't tell you, that the, and these guys can tell you, the number of complaints versus compliments, 10 to 1, 100 to 1, 500 to 1, it makes a difference. It does make a difference. Their courage comes from you. They are you. We are us. That's what a representative republic, a representative democracy is. They are us. We like to say, oh, those guys, those guys, those guys. They sat in the same fifth grade history class, the same eighth grade history class, learned the same thing that checks and balances are only executive, legislative, judicial. We have to encourage and engage. So here's this American Lands Council was established after we passed our legislation in Utah to set a deadline for the federal government to honor the same promise to Utah that it made and kept with all states east of Colorado. After we passed that legislation, many counties came in and said, we want to go on offense. How do we do this? And that's where this American Lands Council was born. We have counties from all over the West coming in, cities. We've got state representatives, businesses coming in, individuals that are joining this effort to go on offense with one voice, with one body, to secure and defend local control of land access, land use, and land ownership as the very foundation of our liberty. So, here's your homework. 
I had it as two by four, but that was too many. And I had this nice two by four and I could go beat people with it, you know, and it was a little abrasive. So I dropped that part of the presentation. Two by three. Study at least two things, okay? I want you to walk away from here, study at least two things. There's so much information on the website. The bill is there, the resolution is there, there's videos there that you can share. Read the Andrew Jackson statement and at least one more thing. And if there are things on there that you don't see, let me know. We'll put them on the resources tab on the website. Study at least two things, teach at least two people. Ask them why the difference when the promises are the same. It's already been done before. Anyone that comes out and says this is somehow radical, unconstitutional, it's already been done before. And then engage and encourage at least two of your jurisdictional giants. Whether it's a county commissioner, whether it's a city council member, whether it's a school board member, right now you have a tremendous opportunity in your state house and senate races. If yours are secure, great, go help someone else. What an amazing opportunity then to stand together to move forward. That's exactly how they did it in the 1830s and 40s. They knew their history, knew their rights, banded together, refused to take no for an answer. We're, we've, we've run out of power here, so uh, let, me just, let me just finish with this. We're probably way over time. And um, When I was young, my grandma used to send me out to get the eggs. And it just scared the heck out of me. The chickens were so mean. <laughs> and they would just pack and pack and pack, and then you'd have to just take your life into your hands. And I was suiting up to go out and get the eggs. <laughs> and I walked out and uh, I'd lift up the lid and grab the egg and go in and grab the egg. And the chickens could hardly, hardly even knew I was there. They were just scurrying wherever they could care less. And I went back to the store. I said, there's a problem with these chickens. There's something wrong with these chickens. They're defective. I said, what's the problem? I said, well, I go to get the eggs. They don't even care less. Most of them don't even know they laid an egg. I said, it's been bred out of them. First Amendment, Second Amendment, Fifth Amendment. Seventh Amendment, Ninth Amendment, Tenth Amendment, Property Clause of the Constitution, our land, which is the foundation of our liberty. It's been bred out of us. There are those of us still that understand the very DNA of our nation, that understand that property is liberty. It's the very foundation of what our nation was built upon. There are those of us among us that still have some resource that still have some time, some life, some fortune, some sacred honor that they can contribute? And if not us, when is there going to be a better generation or a better time? I believe that we will do things even greater than the greatest generation. We have the opportunity to write the history of this moment. What will it look like? This is a wonderful time to be alive. We're lucky not to live in pale and timid times. We've been blessed with the opportunity to stand for something, for liberty and freedom and fairness, and these are things worth fighting for, worth devoting our lives to. So let us go forth with good cheer and stout hearts, happy warriors, out to seize back a country and a world of freedom. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. Um, that's one of our five powers. And so often we look at that one power and say we have no power left. Um, that's devastating and it's tremendous, but 
Yeah, if you look in the, in the book, and there's some books over there, um, if you'd help us with the cost of printing, we $10 and whatnot. But in the book, I believe it's on page 35, Federalist 20, 28 and 46, both Madison and Hamilton said that the states would unite their common forces in defense of their common liberty, that they would create, um, the they would create um, embarrassments from legislative devices that are not to be despised. Um, and then George Washington made the statement, he said, we left the constitutional door open for you. He said that repeatedly. He said that you would have more experience than we would, and so we left the constitutional door open for you. So the five powers, the power of the Senate, the, dry, the election of senators, that's gone. We can cry in our beer all we want, but you have political persuasion of states uniting together. Now that's an exercise in herding kittens, but that's the way it was designed. The second one is legislation at the state level where we simply pass legislation to protect and secure our jurisdiction. We have litigation in the Obamacare. Now, I'm not one that really puts a lot of stock into, you know, the parents asking the children to set their bedtime. You know, it was the states that created the federal government and, and, and that the federal government would have a limited role and then a sub-agent of the federal government. That's kind of like the parents saying, why don't you tell me what my bedtime is and decide your own bedtime and we wonder why we are where we are. But that's one of the powers. And the last one is Article 5 in the Constitution. So why can't we get rid of the 17th Amendment like, just like we did? You certainly can. That would be going through Article 5, but, but we have a very short runway at this point, I'm afraid. And so the process of working forward, because even, even in Utah, even in Utah, it's really, really infuriated me, but even in Utah, we had some very long-standing Republican members of Congress that in their campaign put out their ads that said, oh, he wants to take away your right to vote for your senator. Don't vote for him because he's so bad and evil. He wants to take away your right to vote. And this was a, someone that's been there for a long time. Yeah, I, I, I entirely agree with you. I don't disagree at all that that would be a wonderful thing to attack, but is that the route that will get us there the fastest? I, I think that's, from what I've seen, and I, I chair the Federalism Committee for the American Legislative Exchange Council, and as we're meeting with state legislators, and you look at the process to get there from here, that's a real heavy lift, and it's a real heavy educational lift. Something like a balanced budget amendment is an easier educational lift to, to get there sooner, and then you get people exercising their liberty muscles and getting stronger in that process. But see, we've, you know, it's been bred out of us for so long, we've got to figure out what can, we, what can we get people to understand, sell, and unite around. Land is happening because land we get immediately. Um, balanced budget is another one that we can unite around. I don't disagree with you at all, but we've got to look at, given the runway that we have on these problems, where, where do we start? And so that's, that's, that's my analysis on it anyway. You referred to adopting simple expedient. Would uh, Thomas Jefferson's nullification act be something we should be putting more emphasis on? I think we should adopt this simple expedient of not yielding. <laughs> Words matter. Words matter. And in today, people have taken words and they have twisted and turned them different ways so that if you use certain words, you're demonized. Words matter. The Supreme Court just told us to adopt the simple expedient of not yielding to federal blandishments. And so our language should be, the Supreme Court has told us not to yield. And I think it gets us to the same place. Representative Ivy. Certainly, I mean, certainly, but when you look at what he was saying, he said, you people, you people passed the 16th Amendment, like it or don't like it. He said, I'm not pronouncing policy, but you passed the 16th Amendment and gave them the power to tax, and you elected these people. Grow up. I don't like the decision. I don't like the result. I hate the result. But... 
if the Supreme Court continues to take all of that role on itself and we have a one-dimensional system that we've had, I mean, what happens, we all stand around and wait for someone to give us permission to act. They've just given us permission to act. And so the longer that we sit back and say, let's wait for you for something 10 years to go down the road while his school is shutting down, while, while your, 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 your industry is, is completely decimated, while your forest is ready to completely burn down, and we wait 15, 10 or 15 years for a decision to go through the court, when he said, you are a separate and independent sovereign, sometimes you have to act like it. So restoring that balance, I mean, this is really what our language needs to be, is we have to restore balance in the governing partnership. No one says the federal government should go away. I mean, this divinely inspired system of government was a partnership. We just need to put that partner back in its proper position. But if we act like a dependent, we'll be treated like a dependent. If we act like a partner, when and as we act like a partner, we can expect to be treated like a partner.